Good morning, everybody, and welcome to, uh, I think it's actually maybe the third in our series of talks focusing on issues of importance to Hungary and the Hungarians. I'm Robert Austin from the Center for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, University of Toronto. Before I say a few things about our guests this morning, let me just remind everybody that this is a series we started in the fall with a, with a major event focusing on the, the centenary of the Treaty of Trianon. And then we followed up this term with a, a lecture from Laszlo Borhi at Indiana University, and then a lecture last week, uh, which was, was largely presenting uh, her phenomenal dissertation by Dr. Susan Papp. And this week we have Miklo Zeidler. As a bit of context, we, we wanted to have this series just so we could examine some topics and the, the kind of theme is still Trianon. So that makes uh, Miklos's talk the, this morning particularly important and uh, we're very much looking forward to it. And special greetings to my students from history HIS 364, from revolution to revolution, the history of Hungary. I was telling Miklos just before we got started that this week we started the interwar period uh, in Hungarian domestic and foreign policy. And Miklos, I'm a historian like you and my, the period I specialized on as well, mo mostly dealing with the Balkans was of course the interwar period. And uh, I still find a lot of reasons to examine the interwar period, not just as a trove of, of, of historical, let's say activity, but also some of the links between uh, the problems we have in the present day, which often hark back to some of the issues that came up in the period between the wars. But that said, for me, this lecture therefore is really important. It's front and center for me. That's exactly what I'm teaching. And I maintain an extremely deep interest in, in the interwar period in the Balkan context and as well as the Central European context. So it's a great pleasure to have me close. Uh, just a bit about him from his biography, and I'm going to be reading that, and I'll say a couple of personal things after. Miklos Zeidler is a historian who studied at Edvors Lorenz University Budapest in international relations at the Budapest University of Economics. In 1998, he joined the Department of Modern and Contemporary History at Hungary of Hungary at Edvos Loren University after his PhD, which he got in 2001, and his habilitation, which he got in 2011. He was promoted to associate professor in 2014. In the same year, he joined the Institute of the History of, excuse me, the Institute of History of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences as a part-time senior researcher. Miklos, we have a number of good friends there, particularly Attila Polk, but also Borhi there. We have, this university has a long association with the Institute of History at the Academy of Sciences. Meanwhile, he was a guest lecturer at the College of of uh, hospitality management in Budapest. That's interesting, Miklos. Uh, the Budapest University of Economics and the University of Theater and Film Arts, which those of you who follow Hungarian political life in the contemporary sense will note that that last university I mentioned has been really front and center in some struggles with the, with the current government regarding uh, the management of the university. In terms of his specialization, he's, as I mentioned, he's a specialist in interwar international relations and 19th and 20th century sport history of Hungary. He's published a great number of studies and books, including Ideas on Territorial Revision in Hungary, 1920 to 1945, which forms the bulk of our talk today. On a personal note, uh, I would like to thank Professor Levante Dioshadi, who uh, recommended Professor Zeidler to me. He gave me a number of names, which we followed up on for, for, for the series we're running. In normal circumstances, Miklos would be here in Toronto. And just before we got started, I, I assured him that I'm hoping, not hoping, we will be having him visit us in Toronto next year. And I look forward to seeing Miklos in Budapest. I anticipate being there at the latest in December. Miklos uh, is going to talk for about 50, 55 minutes. Then we're going to have our question and answer uh, where you use the, the Q&A box. So Miklos, you know, virtual welcome to Toronto uh, and greetings to one of my favorite cities, which is Budapest. And uh, the, as people say, the virtual floor is now yours. So over to you. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation for all the professorial staff and the technical staff and uh, the students around. It's really a great, great pleasure uh, to be here online and it's a great honor uh, that you have me uh, on this program. And uh, the following is an overview of uh, uh, Hungary's foreign policy between 1918 and 1945. In order to keep the time limit, I'm going to read my lecture accompanied by 44 slides of a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to discuss five subjects ranging from the breakup of uh, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and the origins of independent Hungarian foreign policy throughout, uh, through the bilateral and international relations uh, of Hungary during the 1920s and 1930s to the period of the so-called territorial revision, when Hungary regained almost half of the territories she had lost after the Great War. 
and finally to the Second World War in which Hungary aligned with the great with the Axis powers. Um, the main task of every foreign policy is to secure the sovereignty of the state by creating a network of international relations which guarantees its independence and territorial integrity. Within such a network, a whole set of bilateral and multilateral political, economic and cultural contacts can be maintained, which makes partners interested in respecting this sovereignty, while opponents are discouraged to jeopardize it. A similar function is attributed to militaries, which by the demonstration of a deterrent armed force intend to make state sovereignty unquestionable. Such a relation between foreign policy and military was mentioned by Prussian general and military theoretician Karl von Clausewitz in the first chapter of his posthumous work on war. Quote, war is merely the continuation of politics with other means, end quote. This concept was also reflected within the government structure of Austria-Hungary, where the two joint Austro-Hungarian ministries were the foreign ministry and the ministry of war. At the end of the year 1918, after the Austro-Hungarian monarchy had broken up, Hungary no longer had a strong army nor an effective network of diplomatic relations on her own. Although Hungary had indeed declared her independence uh, it was fully recognized only by Austria, a country which was in a similarly precarious situation. Defeated, shattered, isolated, burdened with internal minority conflicts and surrounded mostly by aggressive neighbors who demanded territories and war reparations, Hungary was helpless to defend the sovereignty over her territories, either by force or by ways of diplomacy. For 13 months since, September, since November 1918, subsequent governments were unable to secure the victorious powers officially recognized the existence of the independent Hungarian state. The lack of international recognition, just like excommunication in the Middle Ages, practically marked Hungary as a prey, a country which could be invaded by its enemies without having to face sanctions of international law. Therefore, every Hungarian government of this period were, de were desperately seeking the support of patronage of those major political powers which had influence in the region. Count Mihai Károly's democratic government in 1918 embraced Wilsonianism and took a Western orientation, while the proletarian dictatorship in 1919 turned towards Soviet Russia and the international workers' movement for help. The anti-Bolshevik counter-government resigning in southern Hungary, as well as the subsequent counter-revolutionary cabinets, also favored the assistance of the allied and associated powers, albeit with less enthusiasm. Finally, in December 1919, more than a year after the end of the Great War, the coalition government of Károly Hussar acquired international recognition by receiving an invitation to the Paris Peace Conference. The conclusion of a peace treaty was of vital importance for Hungary, whose international order, uh, sorry, uh, whose international position was still unstable. Although prescribing severe peace terms, it was this treaty which finally ended the state of war and established Hungary's place in the new international order, allowing the country to enter into full diplomatic relations with the rest of the world. For the Hungarian peace delegation, it was a lifetime experience to watch the making of the new world order from close and to feel the enormous might of the great powers as well as the positional difference between the victorious and the defeated countries. It also affected the future careers of the delegates. By counting only those who elevated to ministerial ranks, two of the Hungarian delegates became prime ministers six others were made cabinet ministers, and other five uh, became heads of diplomatic missions. After the dissolution of the peace delegation, its members dominated the foreign ministry, the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Trade for many years. From January to May 1920, the Hungarian delegation tried everything to counter the severe peace conditions but neither the speech 
made by Count Opony Albert, the president of the delegation before the Supreme Council, nor the numerous memoranda with which the Hungarians flooded the Paris Peace Conference, nor the secret negotiations between French and Hungarian government officials were enough to turn the tide. Although the British, the Americans, the Italians and the French all showed some degree of interest and sympathy towards Hungary, they were not ready to significantly modify the peace terms. But for Hungary, there seemed to be no real alternative to signing the peace treaty. At the end of a two day discussion in March, 1920, the majority of the Hungarian peace delegates agreed to accept the treaty in view of potential reprisals. It was generally feared that instant diplomatic isolation and an economic blockade would be inevitable and that another military occupation might follow. Some were worried about an increasing persecution of the Hungarian minorities, which might have triggered a massive immigration of refugees from the neighboring countries heavily burdening the Hungarian budget and making future territorial claims unfounded. In mid-May 1920, the Hungarian government discussed the same question and accepting the situation as a case of necessity, decided to sign a peace treaty. The ceremony took place on the 4th of June 1920 in the Grand Trianon Palace in Versailles while massive protests were held throughout Hungary. It took one year until the treaty came into effect in July, 1921, after most of the major signatories had ratified it. The treaty entered the Hungarian Book of Laws as Act Number 33 of 1921, and its first page was printed within black frames as though it had, as though it had been the funeral card of historic Hungary. However, instead of merely mourning over the dissected body of the country, Hungarians developed an almost religious belief in the, uh, in the resurrection of Hungary. Thus, the main goal of interwar Hungary, interwar Hungarian foreign policy, besides conserving state sovereignty, obviously, was the, re the revision of the Treaty of Trianon. These revisionist claims were actually based on the work of the former uh, Peace Preparation Office and the Hungarian Memoranda presented at the Paris Peace Conference. This material contained detailed argumentation and an immense database designed originally to convince the peacemakers assembled in Paris. Now it served the revision of the peace treaty. The documents of the Hungarian peace delegation were considered so important that Prime Minister Pál Teleki, a renowned geographer, and the former head of peace preparations, soon had it published in three languages. Each version contained three large volumes of text and statistical data, and also a box of maps. The English and the French versions were dedicated to the decision makers of the great powers, while the Hungarian edition, besides being a kind of guide to revisionism, tried to convince Hungarian public opinion that the peace delegation had done its best in defense of the country. During these first post-war years, the staff and framework of the new Hungarian diplomacy was also being set up. The organization of a new Hungarian foreign ministry started uh, in November, 1918. Its staff was recruited mainly from among the younger, lower ranking diplomats of the Austro-Hungarian Joint Ministry and completed by other state officials and intellectuals with outstanding language skills. The very few higher ranking diplomats of the Bauhausplatz, that is the address of the headquarters of the former Austro-Hungarian foreign ministry in Vienna, Bauhausplatz. So the higher ranking diplomats of the Bauhausplatz who finally decided to continue their career in the Hungarian foreign ministry had typically been hesitant during the revolutionary period and joined the staff uh, only after the fall of the Hungarian Soviet Republic. No wonder that the capabilities, the foreign contact networks, and the prestige of the Hungarian diplomats left initially a lot to be demanded, which was quite a disadvantage in the international arena. 
According to their political vision and attitude, we might identify two major groups of Hungarian diplomats. Those inspired by the Bauhausplatz mentality mainly belonged to the old school and did not easily realize or accept Hungary's decline and continued to view diplomacy from a great power point of view. For about a decade, uh, they had a very strong influence on Hungarian foreign policy, but in the 1930s, they were gradually put into the shade due partly to their age and partly to a new wave of populism, which had replaced the elitism of the 1920s in Hungary. The old guard was increasingly overshadowed by a new generation of 48ers, a reference to the mid 19th century revolutionary independentist movement. So these 48ers, uh, whose romantic nationalism and strong reservations towards the Western powers induced them to manage East Central European affairs directly with the countries immediately concerned, rather than involving the great powers. Hungary did not have a particularly wide range of bilateral diplomatic relations in the interwar period. From 1919 to 1943, Hungary opened legations and similar diplomatic missions in 26 countries altogether, that is in about one third of all independent states around the world. There were Hungarian missions in the capitals of the four neighboring countries, Vienna, Prague, Bucharest and Belgrade. Of the four real and the two self-appointed European great powers, Berlin, London, Paris and Rome, as well as Madrid and Warsaw. And of seven other European states, joined by Moscow uh, in 1935. In the overseas countries, only the legations in Washington, Ankara, Buenos Aires, and Rio de Janeiro were really important. The diplomatic activity of the missions in Cairo, Copenhagen, Tehran, and Tokyo remained rather formal. Besides these, Hungary also maintained a legation at the Holy See, that's the Vatican, and a representation at the League of Nations in Geneva. Interwar Hungarian foreign policy can, can be divided into two parts. The 1920s were characterized by Hungary's integration into the new world order, which was gradually replaced by a challenge against the European status quo in the next decade. The governments of Pal Teleki and István Betlen considered the consolidation of Hungary's international position and the establishment of solid diplomatic relations as their principal task. Challenging the status quo was not on their immediate agenda, although their long-term goal was indeed the revision of the peace treaty. Political isolation, economic difficulties, and the constant pressure and occasional military threat by the Little Entente, founded in 1920, 1921, urged Hungary to secure her sovereignty in every possible way, even by crossing the barriers of traditional alliances and obtaining the goodwill of the victorious great powers. As a result of this cautious foreign policy and the simultaneous internal consolidation during the Bentland government, Hungary soon found her place in the new European order. There were only two major issues in which Hungary confronted uh, with the great powers. On the one hand, Hungary refused to evacuate the so-called Burgenland, uh, the German populated area of Western Hungary, some 1500 square miles to be attached to Austria. The conflict was finally solved by a compromise by which Hungary was able to keep the vicinity of the city of Sopron, that is about hundred square miles out of 1500 square miles after a plebiscite. On the other hand, Hungary was also reluctant to observe the military terms of the peace treaty. Initially, the Hungarian officials had shown considerable ingenuity in sabotaging the work of the Allied Military Control Commission. And after its departure, they began to increase the number of Hungarian troops and arms beyond the limitations imposed by the peace treaty. These two cases demonstrated a certain readiness on the part of the great powers towards a more lenient execution of the otherwise rigorous peace terms, as well as the limits to their flexibility. Thus, in the first half of the 1920s, 
Hungarian diplomacy was reduced mainly to the unspectacular but necessary everyday matters, working on the establishment of bilateral contacts, entering international organizations, expanding foreign trade relations, securing foreign loans and recruiting influential pro-Hungarian spokespersons, all in order to improve Hungary's international prestige and always with an eye to the future revision of the Treaty of Trianon. According to uh, the late memoirs of a young Hungarian diplomat, the uh, Oladár Szegedi Mossák, leading Hungarian foreign politicians hoped to create a kind of uh, revisionist alliance from the early 1920s onwards, with the participation of the defeated central powers, the dissatisfied Italy, and all ideological differences aside, the isolated Soviet Union. Thus, a coalition of three major powers, Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union, and three small states, Hungary, Austria, and Bulgaria, were expected to cooperate against the Little Entente, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia. This general idea, after certain modifications, did indeed become efficient, if not before the end of the 1930s. Prime Minister Betlen, however, hope to extend the circle of potential partners to the uh, guardians of the status quo as well. He believed that due to their influence in European affairs, the support of Britain, France and Italy was indispensable in paving the way for Hungarian integration and then perhaps treaty revision. Interestingly, however, it was the United States of America whose attitude towards the Hungarian inter interpretation of the frontier question seemed the most promising. The American Congress had not ratified the Treaty of Trianon. In fact, it refused all the peace treaties. Therefore, a separate treaty had to be concluded between Washington and Budapest to end the war. The Treaty of Budapest in August 1921 was limited strictly to bilateral affairs and emphasized that, quote, the United States assumes no obligations under or with respect to the provisions concerning territorial changes described in the Treaty of Trianon, end quote. Despite all Hungarian daydreams, however, growing American isolationism, as well as British and French reservations, soon rendered any hope of tangible allied support for Hungarian revisionism a mere illusion. Germany too, burdened with her own particular problems, refused to support Hungarian territorial claims. The prospects of treaty revision have been somewhat improved by the Italo-Hungarian Treaty of Friendship signed in April 1927, which stated, among others, that, quote, constant peace and eternal friendship, end quote, would prevail between the two countries. More importantly, a secret codicil signed by Betlen and Benito Mussolini declared that the political interests of the two states are identical in many areas and that they will consult with each other on all matters that are likely to affect in any way the cordial relationship between the two countries. Thence, Italy became Hungary's foremost foreign partner, in recognition of which every Hungarian premier and foreign minister paid their first visits to Rome. Mussolini, for his part, made frequent declarations in support of the revision of the Treaty of Trianon. Backed by Italy, Betlen too began to speak more freely about Hungarian territorial demands. Six weeks after the conclusion of the Italo-Hungarian Accord, he openly criticized the peace treaty for the first time after several years. He likened world history to a clearing house in which, quote, the debts and accounts receivable of the countries are balanced. He stated that, quote, with Trianon, the country had paid its debts, but what was owed to Hungary and legitimately demanded were left unresolved and unanswered, end quote. While the Great Depression in 1929 and onwards shed light to the importance of international economic and political cooperation, most of the affected countries tried to find their particular ways out of the crisis, which only deepened the existing political tensions. German, Italian, and Japanese endeavors of expansion, and especially the coming to power of Adolf Hitler, began to simplify international relations. The division between the guardians and the enemies of the status quo became ever sharper, 
and the arch rivals were gradually surrounded by the satellites once again. As a result of these developments, as well as the takeover of Prime Minister Dula Gumbush, an ex-staff officer and an admirer of Mussolini and Hitler, Hungarian foreign policy became more straightforward too. Giving up political alternatives step by step, it now focused on the revision of the Treaty of Trianon by exploiting the shift of the European balance of power. Hungary took a definite turn towards Italy and Germany, while she increasingly neglected Britain and practically overlooked France. In 1934, based on previous treaties of friendship and secret agreements, Italy, Austria, and Hungary signed the so-called Rome Protocols, which raised the economic and political cooperation of the three countries on a higher level. There seem to be two ways to extend this new Central European bloc. The inclusion of Germany could have completed the European axis, Gumbusch's long cherished dream, without necessarily surrendering entirely to Berlin. On the other hand, the creation of the so-called horizontal axis, composed of Italy, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and Poland, uh, this horizontal axis uh, could easily have neutralized the little Entente. These projects, however, had never materialized because by this time it was Hitler's Germany which took over the initiative in forming the political map of East Central Europe. Besides the traditional bilateral relations, Hungary had the opportunity to realize her foreign political aims within the League of Nations established in 1919. The Geneva-based organization was conceived by a growing desire of peace after the immense loss of human life and material in the Great War. The main goals of the League, according to its covenant, were to prevent war, to maintain peace and to promote complex international cooperation. It set out to manage international conflicts, protect national and religious minorities, address world economic problems, promote disarmament, codify international law, and improve health conditions and cultural relations worldwide. The League also took the responsibility for the government of ex-Ottoman and ex-German territories and colonies. The League movement was instrumental in the establishment of the International Labour Organization in 1919 and the Permanent Court of International Justice, 1920, both in close collaboration with the League of Nations. The League was founded by 32 states, the so-called original members, recognized as victorious powers after the First World War. Gradually, uh, the number of member states doubled so that 63 countries altogether participated in, work, uh, in the work of the League of Nations uh, during its, its existence. The figure might seem low at first sight, uh, but in the heyday of colonialism, the number of countries having an autonomous government uh, was below 80, including all many states and the Vatican. From among the largest independent states, according to territory and population, it was only two original states, the United States of America and Hejaz, later Saudi Arabia, which never joined the League, while the membership of Brazil, Germany, and the Soviet Union lasted only a few years. The covenant of the League of Nations had been incorporated in the Treaty of Trianon, as well as in all other peace treaties, Therefore, it seemed logical that Hungary also asked for admission since she had to respect the terms of the covenant anyway. However, it was widely believed that hung, uh, in Hungary that the League was but an exclusive club of the victors where Hungary had nothing to do. Meanwhile, others thought it wise to find out whether the country might still benefit from joining the League or to reverse the question whether it would be a disadvantage to keep out of this new forum of world politics. Weighing the pros and cons, the Hungarian government came to the opinion that the League might be of uh, help in defending the sovereignty of Hungary, widening her international relations, strengthening the protection of minorities, 
and even helping further the most important revisionist goals, namely the readjustment of the Hungarian frontiers and the equal rights in armaments. In September 1922, at a second attempt, Hungary was allowed to join the League of Nations as the 53rd member state. Immediately, Hungary demonstrated great vigor in defending her particular interests before various forums of the League, especially in the cases of the delimitation of the new frontiers, the protection of Hungarian minorities, the Hungarian-owned railway companies operating in the detached territories, and the organization of an international loan to consolidate Hungarian economy. Among the 44 different political issues discussed by the Council of the League of Nations, Hungary was an interested party in six, and only on one occasion was she the passive party. No other member state had more cases before the Council. In addition, approximately 100 Hungarian minority petitions were received by the League of Nations, second only to those of the German minorities, by far the most active national group to present their complaints in Geneva. On the other hand, Hungary showed little interest in the more general issues in the League, such as political, legal, economic, cultural, social, humanitarian, and health cooperation. Unlike other small countries, uh, like Ireland, the Netherlands, and the Scandinavian countries. The cases of utmost importance for Hungary were closed with mixed results. The loan organized by the League in 1924 helped Hungary consolidate her post-war economy. And the Hungarian citizens whose lands had been confiscated in the Little Anton states finally, re finally received some compensation. The delimitation of the Hungarian frontiers, on the other hand, produced only the most minimal rectifications. And out of the 100 minority complaints, only three were redressed by the League. The disarmament conference, where Hungary asked for equality of in armaments, ended in a stalemate in 1933, while the question of the revision of the, of the Treaty of Trianon was not placed on the agenda at all. As early as the mid-1920s, Hungarian critiques of the League of Nations began to voice their dissatisfaction, urging the government to leave the organization. Even Teleki and Betlen were thinking about abandoning the League. At this time, however, political sobriety advised against such a move, which would have increased Hungary's isolation without improving her chances to defend her interests. Later in the 1930s, the gradual alignment of Hungary with the Axis powers finally alienated Hungary from the League, and in April 1939, following the example of Japan, Germany, and Italy, Hungary also left the League of Nations. As previously mentioned, revision was the principal slogan in interwar Hungary. The expression referred to the reconsideration of the Treaty of Trianon, which contained several articles that are detrimental to the Hungarian state, its citizens, and the Hungarian national minorities abroad. Such unfortunate regulations were the introduction of the new frontier line, the limitations imposed on the army, the new rules for foreign trade, the takeover of certain state and private properties in the detached territories, the regulations concerning the citizenship of Hungarians living in the detached areas, as well as the payment of reparations and other war dues. In everyday use, however, whenever revision was mentioned, it meant, above all, territorial revision, that is the total or partial recovery of the lost provinces. As far as the actual Hungarian revisionist claims were concerned, concepts and opinions varied. Territorial revision could, in theory, be achieved by peaceful or military means. In fact, Hungary did not possess the necessary military force to overcome the Little Entente, whose joint forces initially outnumbered the Hungarian army more than 15 times. Hungary could not count on the support of strong and loyal allies either. It was only between 1938 and 1941 that Germany was inclined to provide military assistance for Hungary against Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. 
the Soviet Union might have been ready for a military cooperation against Romania, but such a partnership had been ruled out by the Hungarian government well before it really appeared on the agenda. Although Hungary did begin to rearm in the late 1920s, and the phrases of militant revisionism frequently appeared in the political language, they were hardly more than half-hearted encouragements, and the prospects of a revisionist war were considered entirely unrealistic, even by the Hungarian military leaders. The partisans of peaceful revision wanted to achieve the readjustment of the Hungarian frontiers by way of diplomatic negotiations backed by political, economic, and perhaps military pressure. For this, Hungary first needed internal consolidation and a successful integration into the new international system to improve her prestige and make herself a desired partner for foreign countries. Such a complex preparation, the Hungarian government believed, would bring about changes in the mindset of international politics, which would thus be more inclined to respect the Hungarian interests and more open to the revision of the frontiers. During the interwar period, every Hungarian government invariably emphasized the peaceful character of their revisionist endeavors. Territorial demands could be classified by degree in three major categories. The most popular catchword was territorial integrity, that is the restoration of historic Hungary or greater Hungary. It was inspired by the conservative ideas, the respect for historic traditions, the desire to restore the good old institutions, etc. But its implementation was impossible at the time. Yet the widespread catchphrases like no, no, never, and the so-called Hungarian credo, which was a revisionist transcription of a Catholic prayer, hammered territorial integrity into the heads of Hungarians in front of a home audience, uh, in front of a home audience, government politicians frequently called for integral revision, uh, but in their diplomatic negotiations, they mentioned Greater Hungary only as a point of reference, not as an official territorial claim. As an absolute minimum, Hungarians expected territories along the frontiers populated by a Hungarian majority to be re reattached to the country based on the ethnic principle. Such a solution could have restored a more or less continuous strip of land of some 10 to 20 miles all along the Czechoslovak, Romanian and Yugoslav frontiers, excluding the Croatian border. The supporters of ethnic revision hoped to convince the decision makers of the great powers and the neighbor states that such a readjustment of the borders would help minimize ethnic tensions and provide solid foundations for lasting peaceful coexistence. The new frontier lines would have been drawn as a result of diplomatic negotiations following regional plebiscites, according to the Wilsonian principle of national self-determination, to improve the degree of acceptance among the interested parties. In Hungary, ethnic revision was promoted mainly by Democrats, liberals, social Democrats, and for a while by communists, and thus remained a minority concept throughout the interwar period. A map showing the desired ethnic frontiers was printed in a propaganda pamphlet published by the Hungarian Revisionist League in the late 1920s in English, French, and Italian. This proposal envisaged the restoration of an area of about 13,000 square miles with 2.6 million inhabitants 63% of which were Hungarians. It also indicated the possibility of connecting the predominantly Hungarian Sikler land and the nearby German areas to Hungary proper by a narrow strip of land, the so-called Transylvanian Corridor. The majority of the Hungarian proposals, however, represented some sort of compromise between integral and ethnic revision. These demands included territories beyond the Hungarian uh, ethnic lines, whose restoration was based on economic and military arguments. Such additional territories could be catchment areas of Hungarian towns, 
industrial or mining areas of Hungarian-based companies, major roads, railways, or waterways of economic importance, or even rivers, mountain ranges, and mountain peaks, the possession of which provided strategic advantages. Or it could be an entire province, like Ruthenia, whose economy, according to Hungarian arguments, was largely dependent on the wood export directed to Hungary and the summertime employment of Ruthenian agricultural workers in the Hungarian Great Plain. Such a complex proposal was prepared in 1934 by the Press and Cultural Section of the Hungarian Foreign Ministry, based on Prime Minister uh, Jula Gumbes's instructions. The desired new frontier went well beyond the Hungarian populated territories, included economically important areas, and followed the line of major waterways and dividing mountain ranges to provide more defensible frontiers for the country. Gumbes's plan was intended to almost double the territory of Hungary and add 6.7 million people, only a quarter of them, however, being Hungarian. Preliminary variations of such projects had already been presented to the Paris Peace Conference and international decision makers in 1920-1921. Later, however, Hungarian diplomacy was generally rather reluctant to publish their exact territorial claims in fear of being considered overambitious internationally or too submissive by the Hungarian public opinion. By the end of the 1920s, a flexible formula was conceived, which was in line with the principles of international law and the mainstream liberal and democratic ideas while not necessarily giving up the possibility of total revision. A statement of the official standpoint was circulated by the foreign ministry in May 1929, informing Hungarian diplomatic missions abroad that, quote, Concerning territorial questions, the Hungarian government accepts the principles declared by President Wilson in his 14 points. According to these, the territories populated by a Magyar majority along the frontiers of present-day Hungary should naturally be unified with the mother country, while the reattachment of the rest of the former Hungarian lands, populated by non-Magyar speaking nationalities, should be subject to the free will and the plebiscite of the inhabitants themselves. In 1931, Prime Minister Betlen used the same arguments in a press interview, which he gave to an American journalist. The gradual changes in the European balance of power throughout the 1930s significantly improved the prospects of the territorial changes. In order to conserve the main framework of the European power system, Britain and France no longer ruled out the possibility of moderate changes. This leniency, however, did not satisfy, but further encouraged the revisionist trade powers, Japan, Italy, and Germany, who accelerated their ex aggressive territorial expansion. Meanwhile, Hungary refrained from armed revision because it seemed too risky and potentially short-lived. Instead, Hungary tried to secure the support, or at least the consent, of both political blocs, and to restore her territories by a wider consensus. By the end of the 1930s, Hungary gradually took sides with the Axis powers and, as of 1939, bound herself to them by various agreements. At the same time, Western democracies gradually disappeared from the horizon of Hungarian foreign policy as alternative points of orientation. In view of the desired territorial revision, Hungary accepted one engagement after another and gave up more and more of her independence towards the Axis, without, however, breaking all contacts with the Western powers. This maneuvering brought some temporary results. From 1938 to 1941, Hungary was able to recover almost half of her lost territories step by step every year, going clockwise. In November 38, 1938, 
uh, a German-Italian arbitration award restored to Hungary the southern strip of Czechoslovakia, populated by a large Hungarian majority. In March 1939, simultaneously with the German occupation of Bohemia and Moravia, the Hungarian army occupied Ruthenia, a territory where the proportion of Hungarians was well below 10%. In these two cases, the Allies did not raise objections. By another German-Italian arbitration in August 1940, Hungary recovered northern Transylvania, where the number of Hungarians and Romanians about balanced each other. Finally, in April 1941, Hungary joined the German invasion against Yugoslavia and restored some of her former territories populated by a relative Hungarian majority. The Allies refused to recognize these last two territorial changes. And in April 1941, London went as far as to break diplomatic relations with Hungary. Despite being burdened with all the negative consequences of being defeated in the First World War, Hungary managed five times to recover parts of her lost territories from all of her four neighbors by exploiting the international situation. It was certainly a great success in itself. As a, as a result of the substantial growth of territory and population, 90 and 60% respectively, Hungary greatly improved her economic and military potential, not to speak about national self-esteem. Most of the Hungarians populating the Carpathian Basin had been brought under the protection of the mother country. The number of Hungarian minorities re was reduced to about half a million which was a particularly important achievement in time of war. The reintegration of the restored areas and population into Hungary proved to be much less successful. There were three major reasons to it. Firstly, the neighbor states and most of the reattached non-Hungarian minorities opposed the territorial changes. Secondly, Hungary's uh, financial resources were insufficient uh, to cover the expenses of reintegration and the warlike circumstances did little to help further the process which was gradually slowing down and remained incomplete. Thirdly, the Hungarian government distrusted the new citizens. It considered the new national minorities, about 15% of the whole population, a potential threat to be controlled and even discriminated, which in certain cases resulted in deportation. The authorities were likewise doubtful about the reliability of the reattached Hungarians due to the alleged effects of two decades of denationalization they had been subjected to in the neighbor states. Meanwhile, the territorial changes triggered several waves of emigration to and from Hungary, which affected more people than the dissolution of historic Hungary 20 years before. However, the greatest problem for Hungary created by territorial revision was the deterioration of her international position. Becoming a satellite of the Axis imposed limitations on Hungary's diplomatic maneuvering abilities and state sovereignty. Prime Minister Pál Teleki had declared Hungary a non-belligerent state in September 1939, at the time of the German invasion of Poland, but the government was unable to maintain her semi-neutrality until the end of the war. In November 1940, Hungary joined Italy, Germany and Japan in the tripartite pact to express her gratitude to the Axis powers for the support in the previous territorial readjustments. As a member of this military alliance, Hungary could not keep up her non-belligerent status for long. In June 1941, as a response to an aerial assault by Soviet bombers, Hungary entered the Second World War. By mid-December 1941, the country was at war with the United Kingdom and the United States as well. While Hungary was, according to the words of John Flournoy Montgomery, a former American minister accredited to Budapest, a reluctant satellite of Nazi Germany, 
she nevertheless sent troops to the Soviet Union repeatedly. The Hungarian government soon realized the risk of another major defeat and tried to maneuver the country out of the war. The secret talks, however, carried out between Hungarian representatives and allied agents aiming at a separate armistice took a long time to be completed. In September 1943, a low-ranking Hungarian diplomat uh, received in Istanbul the conditions of an armistice which were to come to force once the British or American troops had reached the frontiers of Hungary. This, however, never happened. Instead, it was the Soviet Red Army which invaded Hungary, Hungarian territories from September 1944 onwards. By this time, Germany, duly informed by the secret negotiations, had already occupied Hungary in March 1944 to prevent Hungarian desertion and secure the country's resources for the war effort. On the 15th of October 1944, an Hungarian armistice to be concluded, concluded with the Soviet Union was disrupted by the German occupying forces and pro-German Hungarian officers who wanted to continue the war against the Soviets. The territory of Hungary thus became a theater of war for half a year, claiming the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians and leaving Budapest in ruins after a 50-day siege of heavy bombardments, artillery fire, and street fighting. The Red Army completed the occupation of Hungary in mid-April 1945. The loss of almost a million people, more than half of which were Jewish victims of the Holocaust, and the massive destruction of Hungarian towns claimed more lives and caused more damage than had the First World War. In 1947, uh, the Peace Treaty of Paris officially deprived Hungary of her regained territories, imposed heavy war reparations, and also approved the country's incorporation in the Soviet bloc. Such a turn of events had, of course, been very hard to foresee in the 1930s. For Hungarian contemporaries, the revisionist claims were rightful and self-explanatory demands which seemed impossible to give up after two decades of expectation and indoctrination. There were, so, uh, there were some, however, who warned against unconditional alignment with the aggressive Axis powers. At the end of 1938, soon after the restoration of the Hungarian part of Southern Slovakia, Bartelaki envisaged total disaster for Hungary in case Hitler should drag her into the impending war. But he concluded his speech with a rhetorical question, quote, who has the strength to rid the public opinion of a nation from a single ray of hope promising a happier life after 20 years of unjust humiliation, legal deprivation and misery, end quote. One year later, with Europe already at war and Hungary expecting the recovery of Transylvania from Romania, Telaki, now prime minister once more, intimated to his friend, the Hungarian minister in London, that, quote, we have to go along with the Germans because there are, there's no other choice, but only to a certain point. We will not shed all our blood in vain in a foreign interest yet it will be terribly difficult, if not impossible, to resist. We are going to be destroyed by revision. That is what is going to carry us into the war. If Transylvania comes back, we shall be eternally obliged to the Germans, and they will demand a price for it. The price will be to go to war on their side, and thus the country itself will be the price of revision. And this is the end of my lecture. And thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm ready to answer uh, whatever questions you have. Thank you. Professor Zeidler, Miklos, uh, absolutely brilliant and incredibly comprehensive. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my, my students are lucky today. And because well, thank you very much. finished on Wednesday, you know, a much more, um, or let's say a much less detailed assessment of the period from let's say 6,000 feet. Uh, mm -hmm. And brought us right down onto the ground, and uh, mm -hmm. much appreciated. So we've got. I get some questions by email, and I get some questions on the Q and A. 
But ladies and gentlemen, we have about 30 minutes for, for a conversation. I might get it rolling, Miklos, if you don't mind. And there's my student, Peter Farkas, uh, is saying, excellent. Uh, Peter, if you can hear me, you almost always ask a question. So feel free to put a question in the, in the, in the Q&A tool, because I want, I'd like to give the students uh, uh, some priority here, because I was stressed that- Sure. Uh, can, can I say something in advance? Of uh, course you can. Uh, I'm more than ready to to uh, send you the text of my lecture for further use. Oh, if I'd love that. It is, if you think it is a good uh, uh, educational, if it has a good educational value, it's, it's no problem. It absolutely, Miklos, because I told the students about the talk. I said, look, you're going to learn a lot here. And, you know, students can be, you know, I, I welcome pragmatism. You know, they study for exams. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, you talk. Because for me, the interwar period, like this is the fundamental, like how does Trianon not just impact Hungarian foreign policy, which you covered, as I said, incredibly comprehensively, but also how does it impact Hungarian domestic policy? Because they're intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's agreed. Then I'm going to send the text to you and then you disperse it among the students, is it? Yes, that's what I would do. I would post it on the course website and the, and the talk will be available of course, uh, to rewatch because it covers everything. And as I said, it's, a, it's the best survey uh, of the period. And those quotes at the end are, are particularly uh, daunting. I'm, I've always emphasized to the students the role of uh, Paul Talecki. And, uh, you know, he was quite prescient in, in understanding what the price of, of this would be in the end. And we all know what he felt or how he felt when, when hungry decided to take part in the invasion of Yugoslavia, right? which cost them dearly later. So I'm gonna go first to, I have a question, Nicholas, but I'm gonna to go to an old friend and colleague, John Stanley, who wants you to say a bit more about Polish-Hungarian relations in the interwar period. Um, there was a, um, a traditional friendship between the two nations. It goes back to the middle ages and then the early modern period up I don't know if, if it's necessary to emphasize it, but um, it's the establishment of the Catholic Church uh, in two countries, basically at the same time, uh, the uh, uh, cooperation between monarchs of, of uh, Polish and, and Hungarian monarchs throughout the 14th, 15th century, sometimes uh, dynasties ruled and uh, were there on both thrones. Uh, and then during the era of uh, um, the Ottoman era, also the two countries helped each other. So there was a great foundation of Polish-Hungarian cooperation. Now, after the First World War, it seemed logical that Hungary and Poland should cooperate once more uh, based on this uh, traditional friendship. The problem being, uh, however, that uh, Poland could uh, uh, be only thankful for her own resurrection to the Paris Peace Treaties, while Hungary was uh, uh, put into the grave by the same Paris Peace Treaty. So Poland could not really help Hungary uh, upset the Paris Peace Treaty system because it would have jeopardized her own existence, at least in theory. So the, the, um, there were limitations on the possibilities of this uh, Polish-Hungarian cooperation, which existed, but it was not very strong. There was no alliance between Poland and Hungary, no treaty of friendship between the two countries, interestingly enough. So that was one, uh, one aspect. There was one thing which could possibly bring the two countries closer, and that was uh, a mutual territorial claim against Czechoslovakia, because uh, the Polish were not very satisfied with the southern borders, uh, with Czechoslovakia, neither were the Hungarians satisfied with the northern borders with Czechoslovakia. Uh, but the, the most important thing was that, that Poland was simply on the other side of the status quo than Hungary uh, between the two world wars. Uh, and uh, there was one, uh, there were two occasions when the Hungarians could help the Polish. One was in 1920, 1921, when there was a, an ongoing war between Poland and the Russians, the Russian Red Army actually, uh, when Poland wanted to invade uh, raid territories in present day Belarusia and the Ukraine. And the Hungarians provided some sort of uh, uh, military assistance, not in the form of troops, but in the form of uh, ammunition. And also uh, in 1939, when uh, uh, the invasion of first the German and then the Russian invasion against Poland 
uh, forced several hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Polish uh, soldiers and, uh, and civilians leave the country. Uh, about 100,000 uh, of them found shelter in Hungary and many of them throughout the entire Second World, uh, uh, Second World War, uh, which the Poles, the Polish people still cherish as a, as a beautiful memory of friendship between the two, two countries. They still remember those tens of thousands of Poles who could survive the Second World War uh, in, uh, in Hungary. Thanks, thanks, uh, John. John, thank you for the question. Um, thank you. Uh, this is from Peter. He had sent a nice compliment saying how great the lecture was. This is one of my students. And uh, we've been talking a lot in the class because, you know, Miklos is, a, is, is the figure of the interwar period. Mm -hmm. He's often a historical figure that's a bit hard to grapple with. And, uh, and there's a lot we know about Horthy and maybe there's a lot we don't know. But Peter's asking this question and I want to add a supplementary thing. He says, you don't mention Horthy. What role did he play? Uh, well, in the, initial, in the initial version of the of the lecture, his name was there, but uh, then I had to, uh, you know, economize with time. But I'm I'm more than ready to to answer it. Um, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that Horta gives his name of an entire period of about a quarter of a century. He was uh, regent of Hungary from 1920 to 1944. He was not a very active politician, so to say. He was more of a, a representative figure. Uh, and this goes back to the fact that he was by profession a soldier. And uh, even at that, he was, uh, uh, he was an admiral. So he spent very little time in Hungary proper uh, because he was at sea uh, most of the time. And he simply did not have a political background. Uh, in Hungary, during the, uh, during the pre-1918 period, uh, soldiers, uh, members of the army, were not, did not have the right to participate in politics. They could not be party members, they could not be representatives of the, uh, in the legislation, etc. So Horthy was a non-political entity until 1918, when, uh, with the end of the First World War, he, uh, he left the army. Uh, Hungary obviously could not have uh, a fleet, so as an admiral, he was simply out of uh, uh, out of service. Uh, but he was asked by uh, friends uh, and uh, great land proprietors, neighboring Horthy's lands uh, near the present-day Hungarian-Romanian border, to participate in a counter-government, which was formed first in Orod, now in Romania, and then moved to Szeged, now in Hungary. Uh, and this uh, counter-government, which was uh, uh, a kind of rival, political rival to the uh, Bolshevik government in Budapest, uh, was set up uh, in May, June 1919. And this was the, the start of Porti's political career. He was 51 years old. This was the start of his political career. And he didn't have political friends. His political family was this counter-government. Uh, and it's very interesting to, to check out the names who were members of this government uh, and put them against uh, the list of prime ministers of Hungary between the two world wars. I'm not going to, to uh, bombard you with names, but I can tell you that from 1920 to 1936, and then from 1939 to 1941, all the Hungarian prime ministers were included in this counter government of 1919. That is to say, the first political friends of Horthy. So this much influence, this small group of people uh, had on Horthy. He had no political background. He, he did not have any party sponsorship or anything. Uh, and although he became regent, he didn't have a, you know, a very great scope of understanding foreign policy or even politics. He was a, he was a military man. He was, uh, uh, his world was not politics. So he relied very much on those people uh, whom he met uh, in 1919 in a, in a town in Szeged, in, in Southern Hungary. Uh, uh, and this government, although it called itself a government, did not have actually uh, a proper activity because it was uh, under French occupation, the whole town, and the French uh, kept this uh, 
this Hungarian government as a possible or a potential substitute once the uh, uh, once the Hungarian proletarian dictatorship uh, is ousted. So this this group of people called itself a government, but it was actually just a political group without without any real activity. And uh, and Horthy thus became uh, um, in 1940 regent of Hungary, which is equivalent to a president of the of the, of the republic, so to say. Uh, but uh, maintained his uh, inactivity mostly in politics. Uh, he selected those people he uh, he had faith in, he believed in, and uh, and it was in very few cases uh, he became active. Like for example, in 1924, when it was uh, the question was raised whether Hungary should uh, uh, should establish diplomatic relations with Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, and also uh, improve its uh, foreign trade relations, uh, thus to uh, start this kind of uh, revisionist uh, coalition in Europe, Horty was very much against it because for him, Soviet Union was nothing but Bolshevism. And uh, he was so active against Bolshevism in 1919, he couldn't imagine that he should shake hands with, uh, with a Soviet envoy in Budapest or let a Soviet legation be established in Budapest, et cetera, et cetera. So that, at that time, he, he activated himself somewhat. Also, uh, in uh, between ni from 1938 onwards, during the, the time of the territorial revision, he was more active than before. He represented Hungary uh, in the new territories, uh, the ceremonial uh, entries of the, of the Hungarian army to the uh, recovered territories uh, was many times led by Horty himself sitting on a white horse or, or sitting in a, in, a, in a large car. Uh, entering uh, into these towns uh, as, as the governor, as the regent now, not only of Trianon Hungary, but the, uh, the enlarged territories. So he became a bit more active. And in 1941, when Hungary entered the war against uh, Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, Horty had, if not a decisive role, but a, um, he was a great instigator of, of uh, Hungary declaring war or, uh, on the Soviet Union. So that was once again when he stepped up uh, and he was, uh, uh, he had a great influence on the government so that the ministers vote for the declaration of war, actually the, to accepting the state of war uh, against Russia. Uh, Hungarian historical tradition says that Hungary never declared war on, on the Soviet Union because it was the Soviets who invaded Hungary, uh, attacked Hungary uh, from the air and the Hungarian government merely uh, recognized that there is a state of war. Uh, so that was once once again when Horty um, showed activity. And then also in 1944, when Hungary uh, wanted to leave the war and uh, uh, and uh, he had to step up to, to uh, uh, initiate the uh, uh, armistice talks with the Russians, then once again, he was active, but very, Usually, he was just a representative figure and politically not very active. That's, uh, Peter, I think we got a terrific answer there, and uh, we'll pick that up in class next week. I'm just going to read you a couple of comments. Almos uh, Tassani has a mention, it was a tour de force summary. Almos has a question. I'm going to get to that, but I want to fuse uh, a couple of questions together and acknowledge George Mezzo. George, you need to send me an email. And I'll get you a PDF of, uh, of Professor Zeidler's presentation. Dara can help me out with that. In fact, anyone who's registered today can get that for sure. But I want to combine two questions, Miklos. One is from Dr. Susan Papp, who I said was, uh, was our guest in the series last week. And she writes, congratulations on an excellent presentation. Could you address the trauma of Trianon and based on your research, how this reverberates to this day, especially in foreign relations? And then I want to bring in another question from a student in the actually in last year's Hungarian history class. Um, great talk. How have the legacies of revisionism affected the current Orban government? So there's some threads in there. So uh, I tried to put the two together because they do address similar themes. Thank you. Yeah, well, <clears throat> for the contemporaries, 1920s, 1930s, it was obviously an open wound. Uh, 
the Treaty of Trianon because most of the families were in one or another way affected by the territorial changes. Uh, Trianon Hungary had about 8 million inhabitants. About 7 million of them were Hungarians, proper Hungarian speaking of Hungarian ethnic uh, uh, origins. Uh, and another four to 500,000 Hungarian uh, refugees entered Trianon Hungary from the detached territories. Uh, and it was not only a burden on the Hungarian uh, 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 budget to help these people survive, give them shelter, give them work or um, subsidies, whatever, but also these people represented Trianon in many ways for 20 years within the country. So they were somehow um, memorials of the detached territories. Uh, there were those people who uh, left family members outside the outside of frontiers or they spent summers there and now their memories of, of these vacations uh, added to Hungarian revisions and etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a, it was a it was a living problem uh, in interval Hungary the detached territories and of course there were three million Hungarians living outside of frontiers uh, uh, whom uh, were looked upon as uh, as uh, uh, people who were discriminated against and who was put upon uh, with whom the cultural connections and even perhaps the political connections uh, were to be maintained. The Hungarian government spent a lot of money to uh, to sponsor the Hungarian parties abroad, etc. So that, there was a some sort of contact, cultural and and uh, political contact between Hungary proper, or Trino Hungary, and the uh, Hungarians uh, uh, of the detached territories. Uh, and when, of course, these territories were regained, uh, then these contacts were re-established, uh, and people thought that this would be forever, this would last forever. And then when Hungary lost these territories again, uh, then once again, the second blow on the Hungarian self-esteem uh, was dealt. Only after that, after 1947, 48, Hungary became uh, a, uh, a communist country uh, in which these nationalistic uh, nostalgies could not be maintained because it was very much against the uh, proletarian inter internationalism uh, um, promoted or uh, professed by the uh, uh, by the Soviet ideology. So somehow, on the surface of uh, of uh, of um, Hungarian self-image, uh, the present-day borders were accepted, but deep down. Uh, in the in the minds and hearts of many Hungarian families, uh, revisionism was still there, even though the uh, uh, communist ideology was very much against it. So after the peaceful transition of the late 1980s, early 1990s, revisionism once again uh, resurfaced in Hungary uh, in its 1930s, 1940s form, because that that's how it was conserved. Uh, and uh, there were certain political uh, um, movements or parties which wanted to make use of it. And there were others which thought it was simply out of place and out of time, uh, part of history, et cetera. So uh, one of the uh, uh, ideological differences between, between the political parties in Hungary goes back to, uh, to uh, the question how these people or how these parties look upon uh, interwar Hungarian history, revisionism, the Horti era as such. Uh, while for the interwar Hungarians, it was uh, a great trauma, obviously, uh, to live with, uh, the new generations, for the new generations, it's not a trauma, it's uh, exactly, it's something like learned trauma. Uh, we learn about it in school, obviously, uh, when we learn history and literature and even uh, music classes, geography classes. Uh, also, there is a trend of remembrance through the family, the memories, but it is a learned trauma. 
Uh, so for the new generations, uh, it's a, it's a, there is a distance between the actual happenings and the and the present day feelings. Uh, as for the question whether the Hungarian government or parties uh, are uh, uh, playing with the idea of potential territory revision, I would say no, uh, because uh, now Hungary has uh, even more, uh, more neighbors than previously. Hungary now has seven neighbor countries. Uh, the number of the Hungarian minorities had decreased uh, in the uh, foreign countries. Now it is less than 2 million Hungarian, uh, ethnic Hungarians in the in the neighboring countries as opposed to more than 3 million between the two world wars. And of course, within the, uh, within the framework of the European Union, uh, the um, importance of, of uh, state frontiers is much, much less uh, than it used to be in the interwar period. Uh, so we belong basically to the same political camp uh, and also the same war camp because most of our neighbors, or, well, some of our neighbors are members of the NATO as well, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, so there's really, it would be, it would rather be, be rather difficult to, to raise uh, territorial claims against any, uh, any of our neighbors. Uh, I'm sure uh, on the other hand, that some politicians cherish such ideas, but it's not on the government level. Uh, we know of politicians who have and, uh, and are still talking about uh, Hungary's just claims and claim justice for Hungary, uh, but they are not uh, government politicians. So that, that is my answer to the question. I think that's a, a very comprehensive answer and thank you very much. I'm going to go now to Almos Tassun, who's a colleague at the UFT and a friend as well. He always, Almos always brings us back to these core financial issues and I appreciate that. So here's Amos. Can you comment on the fiscal crisis of the 1930s and its implications for foreign relations? The fiscal crisis? Like if you think of, well, let's call it the economic crisis of the 1930s. And how oh, crisis. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Economic fiscal, you know, the catastrophe of, of the 1930s. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. No, no, I heard prices and I didn't understand yeah. that. Yeah. Prices. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, basically, the question is how the how the uh, the Great Depression or the uh, World Economic Crisis affected the Hungarian revisionism. Yeah. Well, foreign relations more generally. But yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was it, it was very interesting because Hungary was, uh, of course, uh, from the end of the 1920s when it was backed by Italy and there were some uh, British and French uh, influential less influential politicians and essays who raised the question of revision. So there was a sort of literature of revision already uh, uh, circulating in the world. Uh, the, um, the Great Depression shed light to the, to the great problems of, uh, of Europe where these, uh, when, when Europe there, was, there, were, there were more than 30 states uh, uh, divided by frontiers, and these frontiers were also rather difficult uh, economic or trade frontiers as well, with very high uh, tariffs. Uh, and the one of the ideas was that political borders should be maintained, but the tariffs should be reduced, so that something like economic borders should be abolished, but political borders should be maintained. And uh, ideas were about the re-establishment of the former, more or less the former uh, uh, frontiers of uh, Austria-Hungary as an outside frontier. And inside it, economic frontiers would be demolished or tariffs would be reduced to very low uh, degrees. While of course the, uh, the uh, political frontiers would be maintained. So that these areas which used to be economically complementary areas, uh, one producing uh, um, um, agricultural goods, the other is stronger in, uh, in, in industry, the third is, I don't know, provides uh, capital, etc., etc. So this kind of uh, trade and economic cooperation should be re-established between the countries. Uh, 
between the countries belonging uh, to the former uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Or there was the idea of the uh, German-Austrian uh, 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 Customs Union, mm -hmm. 1931. Uh, and um, of course, those countries who were the beneficiaries of the, of the status quo uh, after, this, uh, after the First World War did not want any changes because they thought that maybe the abolition of economic frontiers would bring about the abolition of the political frontiers. Uh, but the Hungarians were also not very happy with that because they thought that if the economic frontiers will be abolished and everything is going to be all right, then there will be no need for the abolition of the political frontiers. So funnily enough, both sides, uh, and now I'm going to simplify it, both Hungary and the Little Anton countries were pretty much against any intermediary solution because the Hungarians thought it's too little and the Little Anton countries started too much uh, change uh, in the status quo. And it's very interesting. Uh, it's, not hung, it's not a question of Hungary, but I think it, it's a very interesting question how the great powers responded to a problem. Uh, the, the problem of the um, uh, Austro-German uh, uh, Customs Union, uh, which was raised in 1930, as far as I know, uh, and uh, while the Anschluss, the political uh, union of the two countries was uh, uh, banned by both by the Treaty of Saint-Germain concluded with Austria and the Treaty of Versailles concluded with Germany, uh, a customs union could be established. There was no, uh, no uh, impediment uh, in uh, international law against such a thing. But of course, everyone remembered what happened in the 19th century when uh, the German unification started with the establishment of the Zollverein in the early 1920s, when the, when the economic frontiers between the German principalities was abolished, and voila, 50 years, and there is the German Empire. So nobody wanted, uh, nobody, well, except for Germany and Austria, nobody wanted the, uh, the customs union of these two countries, and uh, the French and the British brought the question in front of the, uh, uh, of the international uh, uh, court in The Hague. And that was a draw when the, when the international lawyers, uh, when the international jury uh, uh, voted and it had to be the president of the board to decide who was an Italian and he voted against it. So the, the question of whether there should be uh, a kind of uh, economic anschluss between Germany and, uh, and uh, Austria in 1931 uh, was decided by just a single vote of an Italian who was of course politically uh, very biased against, uh, against the greater Germany. Um, so there were very intensive thinking about how the uh, how the problems, the economic problems could be overcome without the political changes. Uh, but then in 1933, uh, the so-called full power talks, uh, uh, which started between uh, Germany, uh, Italy, France, and Great Britain. Uh, they started sometime in, in March and ended in July with the, uh, with the uh, signing of the uh, of the Four Power Treaty. Uh, then the question of certain territorial changes also emerged. And one uh, area where the British, especially Churchill, saw the possibility of, uh, uh, of a territorial readjustment was the city of Danzig, the corridor uh, linking uh, uh, Danzig to Poland, dividing uh, East Prussia and West Prussia. And the other was uh, Transylvania, with the mixed population of, uh, of uh, Hungarians and Romanians. Uh, so suddenly in, uh, in March, April 1933, the Hungarians uh, saw in the newspapers, in the British and French and other newspapers, that there's a chance that there, there's going to be, or maybe there will be, uh, territorial revision on the eastern frontiers. But it, it was just a, a very ephemeral uh, uh, phenomenon and uh, and uh, it lasted only a few weeks and then uh, the great powers decided that they would not change the political status quo but that was the first real chance for Hungary uh, for revision or at least a chance which 
seem to emerge that now the great powers are uh, taking, are putting territorial revision on the agenda. But it, it lasted very, very shortly. At this time, Hitler was already at power and simply London and Paris did not want to, uh, to, uh, to let Hitler be the, uh, the leading figure of, rev of revisionism in Europe. So when I spoke about the simplification of, uh, of uh, foreign policy in the 1930s, when uh, uh, certain ideas of cooperation or, uh, or uh, um, uh, cooperation, collaboration between victors and, and defeated countries of the First World War started, especially in the 1920s. Uh, it quickly came to an end in 1933, soon after Hitler's coming to power, because the French and then the British thought that that Germany is not a Germany with which uh, one could uh, uh, one could uh, come to an agreement, and this, of course, affected Hungarian revisionism or the prospects of Hungarian revisionism as well. Miklos, we've got. I hope first I want to check with Daria there or Adam to make sure. I would like to go a little bit past eleven thirty because I originally saw we had one question, but then a, a very important question came in from Judy Young, and I want to make sure we get that. So uh, we're not running a prison here. So if you have to go, you have to go. Mm -hmm. Because these are two really important questions that I want to put mm -hmm. you. I'm going to bring them both together, and then that'll be a wrap up, and then we'll mm -hmm. the session. But I've got Judith Farkas ask saying, Miklos, it was an absolutely fascinating talk in every aspect. Very true. Uh, could you shed light on Hungary's secret talks with Britain, led by Istvan Horthy? And then Judy Young uh, mentions, and again, I, there's there's a way to link some of this. Uh, Professor Zeidler had a tiny sentence in his talk about how some of the territorial revisions, for example, Northern Transylvania, resulted in, quote, certain cases in the certain cases in the deportation of people. Can he say a bit more about this? Thanks. So again, you wants to hear about uh, secret talks with uh, Britain, and then Judy wants a little bit more detail on the, the deportation of people as a result of these uh, Vienna awards, particularly Vienna Award 1, Vienna Award 2, which would have been Northern Transylvania. Yes, um, I don't know what exact role uh, the uh, older son of the regent, uh, Istvan Horti, had in the uh, secret talks with the, with the, we call them the Anglo-Saxon powers, uh, the British and the Americans. He probably did not have direct talks, uh, but um, maybe in the, in the next few years, there are going to be more, uh, more data on that because the, uh, the, um, uh, the documents which uh, which remain in the possession of the Horty family are now being published. Uh, it's not entirely uh, clear in what order they are going to publish and to what extent their documents, but it certainly had uh, had been started. So there could be that in the near future, say in the next few years, there are going to be uh, interesting documents which shed light on this particular uh, uh, question too. Certainly, uh, either he was uh, uh, included in these talks, or as I think he was not, uh, the, uh, the idea was that Hungary uh, should be uh, taken out of the war. Uh, this idea actually emerged at the very end of 1941. So, Practically in the days when Hungary uh, 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 was at uh, at war with uh, with uh, uh, with the United Kingdom and uh, and the United States, uh, she already wanted to to get out of the war. Uh, secret talks started in 1942, uh, not between uh, diplomats because it would have been too obvious, uh, but secret agents from the uh, American and uh, and uh, British side and uh, journalists and uh, foreign policy experts from the Hungarian side. Uh, and by the time, and of course it was always carried out in so-called neutral states. Uh, if, if you know the, uh, the, the great film Casablanca, uh, it's, it's obvious that in, in countries where, uh, for example, Hungary and, uh, and uh, the United States and, uh, and Hungary and uh, Britain uh, severed uh, diplomatic relations. So there's no diplomatic talk uh, uh, anymore. But in, in uh, neutral countries where both the British and both the Hungarians 
and the Americans maintain their, their legations, there is a chance uh, for diplomatic talks. Uh, so therefore, during uh, a wartime, the importance of uh, neutral countries is always, uh, uh, always greater. Portugal, in a way, Spain, Sweden, um, Switzerland, and Turkey, interestingly. Uh, and uh, it was exactly in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, where a, a low-ranking Hungarian diplomat who went there uh, to uh, uh, the cover story was that he went to Turkey to to buy uh, old Ottoman uh, uh, manuscripts referring to the Hungarian uh, uh, the invasion of Hungary in the Middle Ages. Uh, he actually went there to to meet the American consul in Istanbul, uh, and it was this consul who uh, uh, who. Uh, uh, gave him the, um, the terms of a secret separate armistice with which uh, this young diplomat came to Budapest, showed it to the government. They agreed that the terms are acceptable, uh, but of course, Hungary had to wait until the, uh, uh, until the British or the American troops reached the Hungarian border so that they could lay their arms in front of them. Until the, the enemy, uh, uh, has not approached uh, the frontiers, uh, there was no way uh, an armistice could be concluded because the, the case of Italy showed, who, who announced the armistice without uh, waiting for the American troops, that simply the Germans invaded northern Italy uh, and, uh, uh, and defended the, the northern part of Italy for, more, for almost a year. So Hungary did not want to be occupied uh, by the Germans uh, after a, a, a premature uh, announcement of the uh, of the armistice, uh, but then it was not the Anglo-Saxon army, but the but the Russians, but the Soviet army, which uh, which reached Hungary in 1944. So we had to so Hungary had to uh, uh, um, conclude uh, an armistice with the with the Russians. And I, I repeat, I don't know, and I don't really think that uh, that Istvan Horthy himself personally had uh, a great role in, uh, in, uh, in these talks. Uh, he was probably uh, included in the very short group who knew about these developments. But then again, he died in 1942, in, uh, in uh, August the 20th. Uh, his, uh, his plane was... Uh, his plane crashed in the in the Soviet front, actually, and uh, uh, so afterwards, obviously, he was not not a part of, of the talks, if if ever he was before. And the uh, the second question uh, was about the uh, what was about it was about the uh, in uh... deposition. Yes, uh, well, um, with the reattached territories. Uh, especially in uh, Ruthenia and uh, Transylvania, uh, several tens of thousands, or I, sh no, I should probably say hundreds of thousands of Jews, uh, Jewish Hungarians uh, uh, were reattached to Hungary. Uh, and Hungary began to, uh, uh, to legislate against uh, Jews uh, from 1938 onwards. First, trying to um, uh, um, oust them from uh, uh, from the political positions, cultural positions, uh, well-paying, uh, uh, well-salaried jobs, and later, from 1944 onwards, of course, after the uh, the German occupation, uh, uh, now the life of the Jews uh, was also threatened. But uh, the uh, recovery of uh, of uh, Ruthenia, that's now part of the Ukraine, uh, produced uh, about 100,000 Jews, now once again Hungarian citizens, and the reattachment of northern Transylvania somewhat more. The problem was that according to these, uh, according to the agreements of reattachment, these Jews became automatically Hungarian citizens. But the Second anti-Semitic law, second Jewish law, 1939, uh, uh, declared that no Jew can receive a Hungarian citizenship. So the two agreements, the law and the agreements, were colliding with each other. And then uh, 
the process of nationalizing these Jews uh, was not an automatic process, but it had to go through the Hungarian authorities. And many of these reattached Jewish families could not present papers to the Hungarian authorities uh, stating that they have a Hungarian nationality. Uh, it was uh, it was obvious they do not have these documents because previously nobody wanted them to have these. Uh, and, and then they could not produce them. And the Hungarian authorities in many cases uh, were rather adamant and rather uh, 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 ill-advised uh, to say that the, uh, to uh, to say that these Jews would never get Hungarian uh, citizenship, and in 1941, uh, a large-scale deportation of those uh, people who did, who could not produce citizenship papers in Hungary started uh, exactly at a time and at a place when when and where the uh, uh, German troops invaded southern Ukraine. So deportation started in July to territories of southern Ukraine, which was actually a theater of war between uh, Germany and Soviet Russia. Uh, and this heartlessness of the Hungarian authorities to, deep, to deport these Jews, either of Hungary, Hungarian origin or not, uh, resulted in uh, their being uh, caught practically between two fires because they were deported in a theater of war. And uh, at least 20,000 of these Hungarian Jews were killed by the German troops there who did not want to take care of these additional people problems, especially Jews. Uh, and then the Hungarians stopped deportations. Uh, it's not exactly clear whether they were uh, appalled by their own heartlessness uh, or it was on the, uh, uh, it was because the Germans asked them not to deport people to that territory, which was now under German control. Uh, however, uh, Hungary lost about 20,000 Jews uh, in the summer of 1941, deported from Hungary and killed in, uh, uh, in Ukrainian territory. Uh, and uh, some of these people were not from Ruthenia, but from Northern Transylvania. So both from territories acquired from Cheslo Czechoslovakia and from Romania, there were several thousands of Jews who were killed in 1941 uh, because of the, uh, of the uh, uh, how shall I put this, heartlessness or, or uh, over rigidity of the, of the Hungarian authorities. Uh, and uh, due to the uh, to the German army, uh, which uh, uh, got rid of these people, and then uh, of course uh, there was a second phase of dep deportation uh, from uh, May 1944 onwards, which was now directed to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, work camps and uh, extermination camps uh, under German control. Uh, and the number is much higher. It's uh, somewhere uh, around 440,000 Hungarian Jews deported uh, to these concentration camps. And uh, uh, as far as we can estimate, uh, about three quarters of them uh, became uh, victims uh, of, the, uh, of these extermination camps. So somewhere around 350,000, maybe even more uh, died in these concentration camps. So there were two, two waves of deportation, one shorter scale uh, in 1941 and the large scale as part of the end losing really in 1944. Well, Miklos, we're about 10 minutes over time, but I'm really glad that we did it's that. It's not a problem with me if, uh, if there are still questions and, uh, and students are ready to. Okay, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I have another meeting, but I'm gonna take one more question because she's a former okay. student. She's a former student, and I haven't seen her name in such a long time, and her, and I was so happy to uh, see it. So I'm going to read it to you. First off, thank you for such a wonderfully detailed talk. Given that Orban has sought to cultivate better ties with regional leaders, do you believe COVID became almost an indirect opportunity for the rather restrained commemorations of Trianon this summer, so as not to further provoke political tensions? Okay. 
uh, uh over there but i'm going to leave it there because you know 10 you know jennifer mentions it 10 years ago it was a little different but i i would concur with jennifer i was supposed to be covering those those conversations um you know 10 years ago it was a little bit different but what do you think covid uh different attitude because it was quite it was it was a little bit calmer than what we might have expected from the current government it was much calmer and uh seeing from here uh, and i think yeah this is this is the uh, uh this is the truth that this was a, a glorious escape uh, for the government uh, uh it's all it's always difficult when you want to to do something whether you're talking to your own audience or whether you talk to a foreign audience and obviously the the home audience would have uh, would have liked something uh, mm, uh something richer something uh, uh uh, uh, more nationalistic, maybe especially uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the great the basic supporters of Fidesz and the Hungarian right would probably uh, wanted uh, uh, greater commemorations, uh, more statues, uh, uh, etc. Uh, while of course uh, Hungary had to be very cautious uh, uh, internationally because of the of the problems uh, she had the government had with the uh, with the European Union and with the the neighboring countries. Don't forget that now uh, the Hungarian government is trying to, the governing party is trying to establish some sort of a, a full country block within the European Union uh, with Slovakia, Romania, and Serbia, uh, or Croatia. It's, uh, well, Croatia in the first place, but also maybe Serbia. Uh, and any uh, stronger cooperation between these four countries could be jeopardized by over-nationalistic uh, rhetoric. So I think it was a, it was a trap for the government uh, and uh, they were lucky uh, not to be caught in this trap. So the COVID came at the right moment, I think in this sense. That's a pretty interesting silver lining for, for what we're going through. And Jennifer, I'd also exactly. send a question to uh, Miklos by email because I wasn't sure that we'd get to it. But on that note, I think we're going to pack it in. But Miklos, I need a, if you can give some thought, and we're, we are definitely going to stay in touch. And this morning was just terrific for me and for my students, and it was, a, it was an amazing audience. But Miklos, I want someone, because of this COVID nonsense, I want someone to give us a virtual tour of the new Trianon Memorial. So if you could think of someone, I'd be most interested. What I mean by virtual tour is someone to take us through it. Uh, and then we could we could do it live or something like that because I'm, I was very interested in that. And then I could include that as part of my series that I'm working on with Professor Dio Shadi. So it, it was you, but I mean, someone's got to put on a camera, someone's got to go in there and it's got to be prepared and take us through when, uh, when possible, because I was not able to be there, obviously, in June of 2020, for I was, I had, a, uh, I was covering it for international media, but uh, I'd like, I'd like to see it. So, give it some uh, thought. I haven't seen it myself. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, it is a practically a subterranean uh, uh, labyrinth, uh, yeah. and on the walls there are the names of the Hungarian uh, communes and towns and cities. Uh, not, not only the ones which have been detached, but all the communes, uh, absolutely mixed. So this is the idea, and uh, this is a very moderate approach to revisionism, if you like, because it is subterranean and it is just practically just a list of names. Uh, interestingly, not a list of people, people's names, but a list of, uh, of towns, towns' names. Uh, but I think uh, this is, again, a reflection of, of this kind of uh, cautious uh, revisionism or cautious remembrance, which mm -hmm. takes into account the home audience and also the, the international audience. Uh, as far as I know, someone, I don't know if, if it was, uh, if it was an independent uh, journalist or whoever, or it was the government, which, uh, which actually filmed the whole uh, monument. I think they used a drone, but I, uh, I'm trying to find it on the internet. And if not, then I'm, let's keep in touch and we'll try to find out who might help. To do something, um, and again, I don't know if Daria or Adam's gonna get mad at me because we're supposed to end, but I wanna do, I've got my students thinking about memorialization. And this is something we're working on very closely in our class. 
I would like a presentation, and if it's you, great. I would like someone to look not just at that memorial, but overall Trianon memorialization within Hungary, because there's there's more to it than than the than the centenary memorial. And I think that's a very interesting topic for the series. And again, I, I am sure Professor Dioshadi would agree with me and one of our other supporters, Tibor Fekete. So think about that and let's revisit it next week. And then it becomes very visual. Do you know what I mean, Miklos? Yep, yep. And mm -hmm. I know the students would enjoy it. Then they have a big paper due in April, so they're maybe do it sooner rather than later. But this morning was terrific. It was, you know, this afternoon for you, I hope that you have a nice weekend ahead of you and that, uh, you know, that this, I know Hungary's uh, encountering a, th a really third wave of COVID. So here in Canada, we're thinking about you. We see that Central Europe is is being battered by very harsh con COVID conditions, not just Hungary, but Slovakia, very poor statistics, Czech Republic as well. Um, you know, I see a light at the end of the tunnel and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, either in Toronto or Budapest. I want to say special thanks to Daria Dumbadze, my very dear friend and colleague and Adam Bell who do this technical stuff for us, meet close. My thanks too. And such an, a nice audience. It's It was a real pleasure for me to see some familiar names and faces and you I look forward to when we're sitting back in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and that we're having a nice conversation and we get to see everybody. So that said, uh, thanks for joining us. Miklos, we'll be in touch next week. Have a terrific weekend, everybody. Uh, this ends this, and then Miklos and I stay on camera just for a bit so that uh, we, the Adam can make a clean cut to the thing and it will be available to all of you who attended and I'll get the slides to you and everything. Miklos, real pleasure for me. It really, really was a great way to spend the morning for me. Thank you. Thanks so much. for having me.